Well, good evening. How's everybody? How many of you had good sense enough to take a nap this afternoon? All right, so we know who the alert people are going to be tonight. Okay, if you all would stand. a matter of prayer. Preachers running a few minutes late. Y'all need to pray against here.
It's been a good day so far. How about for you? And we trust the Lord will be merciful and gracious to to us tonight as we will honor and obey him with the communion and trust the Lord will meet and meet and, and lift all of our burdens. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us tonight. So often we just get encumbered. And Father, we pray you'd bless us tonight to just separate ourselves from the world and just look to you and trust you with our burdens and all that that we face. We pray you'd have your hand on our church. We pray that you'd bless each ministry and each opportunity that we have. We thank you for the soul saved yesterday. And we just pray that as we continue into this week, There'll be more souls for the harvest. Bless us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much. You may be seated. I had uh, an interesting afternoon. I don't know. I, I think that computers are good, but they sure can test your faith. And I almost gave up, went back one more time, and I found what I was looking for. And got it printed, and uh, it fell off. It's uh, it's a good day to to worship Him. I believe we're going to be where the Lord wants us tonight. Usually, when you you find opposition, it's because there's a purpose, and I think I think that we'll we'll um, we'll be blessed. So we trust the Lord to. To do that, if you have a bulletin, you can look through the opportunities this week. I don't know of anything that's really pressing. Um, again, prep, again, the preparations made for VBS and the other announcements, I believe, are self-explanatory, and we trust the Lord will will uh, have His hand upon these opportunities, and we'll see souls continue to be saved. All right, let's continue with our fellowship time and. We'll get uh, back on track. If y'all would stand our fellowship song tonight, it's God making a way. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways. Somebody's hand, tell him you're glad God makes a way.
God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength Brother Kent, lead us in prayer, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together tonight. Uh, just give us the ears to hear the message and uh, the thanks for being in your house, yes. Lord, to give you praise, to lift up those who can't be here, uh, to pray for those that uh, are going through difficulties. Uh, Lord, you know my daughter's needs. Uh, and there are many others here in the church that, that need your special great physician healing. Lord, we just ask you to uh, be with us tonight, uh, plus the uh, offering. Uh, give our pastor the words, and uh, uh, just thank you, Lord, for uh, all you do for us. And we ask all this in your precious son's name. Amen. Amen. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he would send his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the suffering and loss, the father turns his face away. While wounds which mar the sinless one Bring many souls to glory Behold the Lamb upon the cross My sin upon his shoulder Ashamed of him, my mocking voice Drawn out among the scoffers It was his love that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished 
Got it covered up. Brother Kent, in his prayer, verbalized what I had on my heart today and uh, didn't, didn't really settle it. I didn't complete the sermon this morning, and for a while I thought that would be a continuation, but then praying over the service tonight, I, I kind of felt the burden of the prayer. Uh, his daughter Robin is having some major health issues. He's been up to see her and could be on notice to go back at any moment. Uh, Brother Kent's one of many. He and our church have family members, friends, or you yourself have a situation that you face. And, you know, we, we think about we're not alone, and that's true. But what we have to, we have to, I believe, apply, and I believe that's the, the right word, is what God has provided for us. You know, it's one thing that we might take things on ourselves and seek to fix it. And sometimes with family, and especially health issues, because Ella and I both have had cancer, had the battle, and God's been good. But that's representative of many of you. You, you know that, you know that trail. And sometimes whenever we can't just, we get where we feel like we can touch it, it seems to elude us. Does God have a plan for us? I mean, is this something that we do and it's a, a, a chance, it's a gamble, it's a I hope my number comes up attitude, or can we have something to, to sink our teeth into? And this is happening on the night of communion. And uh, if there's anything that should, should unite the church, it's communion. Because communion is a memorial service. That means it's, it's a time in which we come to, to soberly, soberly thank God for giving his only begotten son to die for us. That there's no other purpose. There's no other. You can, you can, I guess some people do add things to it, but that's the bottom line. That's what he did for us. And so tonight, if you'll notice the title, the title is A Power of Agreement. Now, in life, we know a little bit about that. We, we have fought world wars where you had two sides, and they came together on an agreement. Now, as Hitler did with Russia, he broke it. And that doesn't mean, you know, in, in man's case, you may make the agreement, but that doesn't mean that the, the agreement's going to hold. Maybe that influences our thinking with God somewhat. Because if the devil could, he would disrupt that. If he, if he could, he would get, you know, get us distracted from, from the promises of God. And if, if, that's, if that's understandable, then we should be able to predict somewhat how he's going to, to attack us. And, and uh, maybe in some cases you say, well, he already has. Then let's look at this together for a bit. Uh, you got a picture of a handshake. A handshake can be a time of fellowship or welcome, but a handshake also can be the sealing of the deal. When I grew up, I was early enough in life, and maybe you were too, uh, in the area, the rural area of Florence County that I grew up in about 60 miles away, and I'm sure it was true in, in Bayboro, and it was true over in Ana and other parts of the county for those who grew up Oreites. But my daddy did business with a handshake. Didn't sign contracts, just a handshake. And that was early in the founding of our country. I mean, that's kind of how we, how we, the banking was done on the handshake. And, and so, you know, all, all this that we have around us, but I, I want to introduce tonight the importance of agreement. And the, I believe the handshake is a visual. We are in agreement. Now, if we take that to the, 
to the extreme we can't see it here but whenever we whenever we have agreement with God that hand that's invisible where he takes us by the hand you know that should be probably the most confidence you and I have in anything because if God promised it God's going to deliver it it's not on his end that this thing isn't going to work it's on our end that it, that's where it becomes feeble so that's the first visual here's the second visual a flock of ducks or geese I'm not an expert and if I had some of you who do duck hunt you might know what we're looking at here I see it's white with with black tips on their wings but they fly in formation they got one leading the pack you can see it with ducks they populate the area over behind uh, Sam's at uh, over by Lowe's those pond, holding ponds and they seemingly when I'm in a hurry decide to cross the road <laughs> and it doesn't matter if it's 17 or whether it's one of the streets they stop the traffic and they'll waddle their way on across but they cross in line they line up the most difficult thing that I learned early about being a, pa a Baptist pastor is to get people lined up because oh how Baptists love to fly solo you know we, we kind of like to go and do our thing to some degree and I'm sure that's true of others as well but we got two visuals it's instinctive you don't have to teach ducks how to do this you don't have to you don't have to to, to you know tell hey you gotta get lined up here they they instinctively know that it would seem that with the Holy Spirit indwelling us we wouldn't have to be taught either if we yield to the Holy Spirit as we looked at this morning if we submit to God lining up's not a problem getting out of line would be the problem because the Holy Spirit's there to kind of nudge us on so look with me in your Bibles first Matthew 18 verse 19 and and this is a verse that I do not need to to bring to your attention on a Sunday night in an evening service in 2018 but it's good and it was good for me to be reminded because I got to thinking about this Brother Kent shared with me various doctors who have been consulted over his daughter Robin's health. And uh, he told me something I never heard. I didn't know it could happen. He mentioned that his daughter had had wisdom teeth extracted. And apparently there was a virus or something that happened when that took place that caused her to almost become paralyzed from the waist down. I never heard of that. I know I had a wisdom tooth pulled. I won't ever do that again. <laughs> that didn't hurt. It affected how I chew. And and I my lips and tongue and whatever, because it was on I don't know. I'm right handed. I guess it's the right jaw. I don't know why it happened, but they kept telling me you don't need it. And they were gonna have to it had kind of gum and grown over it a bit and they said best thing to do is take it out like you're popping popcorn or something let's just take that out you could pay me five thousand dollars to have it done again because it has disrupted how I enjoy my food especially if I want to really crunch ice or something and I need that tooth I use that tooth they told me I didn't but I do and I tell my grandkids they've had to go have it done I said I wouldn't do it I wouldn't do it they had to beat me to do it they can take a laser and clean the gum up if they need to I can put up with the gum healing but I can't put that tooth back but anyway we, we, we sometimes get in situations where we don't necessarily realize how valuable something is to us and then in the case with with Kent and the family with the wisdom tooth people I wouldn't lose sleep over that but after hearing about Robin's situation I might would 
because of the complications it's set up. And this went on, did you say 10 years? Of, uh, I mean, it's, it, 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 just, it became latent in the complications that it's, it's created, and they're having all kind of problems figuring out how to, how to help her. And, uh, but if you, you look at this with me, again, I say unto you that if how many? Two of you shall agree. Now, you could break it down to husband and wife. You can break it down to two individuals. But we're starting with two here. If two of you shall agree on earth, so we know the location. We know that's here. And then he says, as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is where? In heaven. I've heard people say, in the church, especially if they got their feelings hurt, they'll say, I don't need anybody. Really? Really? If God says I need somebody else to agree with me on something, that as touching means that we're together on it. We're in lockstep. It's that handshake that we're, we're in step on. And, and we can develop an attitude, I, you know, I don't need anybody. Wrong. If you need to do some heavy lifting, that's wrong. If you're facing something that's a storm, he's promised us a few things. If, if two, and that's the premise. Verse 20 says, for where two or three are gathered together in, in my name, there am I in what? In the midst of them. How many twos and threes do we have in the room? Then the question we have to really answer is, who's here? Is he here? Yes. He's here in the heart of each believer. But there's a promise about his manifestation if two of us will agree. And that's where the heavy lifting comes in. I read a testimony. In fact, the gentleman may be watching who sent me a link. And the uh, person whose testimony I, uh, I read had, had had cerebral palsy. And when he, he was young, he got caught up in the uh, Speak It Faith crowd and chased a lot of the TV personalities who, who do the healing on stage and these sort of things. And he attended a number of those meetings trusting that he could be healed. Didn't happen. And to some degree get disillusioned. Have you ever said, or heard somebody say in a tragedy, if the Lord were here? You, you, may, you remember John chapter 11? Lazarus died, and Mary and Martha were upset that the Lord was late, and they said, Lord, if you'd have been here. Have you ever had that attitude about something? If only the Lord were here. We'll get two people together. He's here. We're going to trust a man more than we do God. Why would we chase? Why would we chase a man traveling across the country, going wherever, standing in the lines to get in to, to hope that a man could heal us? Is that making sense to anybody? Amen. He is here. Or his word is wrong. We've got to face that. I think sometimes we're happier in denial than we are in the power of agreement. What he promised us. And, and I, I felt a sense of urgency about sharing this tonight. I don't know who for. I don't know if it's someone watching on the stream. But there are promises in God's word that we must claim. 
And, and I don't see anywhere that he puts limitations. You got verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together, notice this now, in my name, there am I in the midst. So obviously, he's describing a worship service. But yet we're living in a day where the attitude among many when it comes to worship is an option. I mean, so many opt out on Wednesday night, Sunday night, other times. But I, I don't remember someone came to me recently and made the comment because they attended a Wednesday night and told me how much they enjoyed it. And certainly Wednesday night is not, you know, we're not seeing a Sunday morning attendance. And the comment was how sweet the service was. You know why Wednesday night's sweet? because believers are here I mean you, you can't imagine what you overcome on Sunday morning as to what you have when God's family get get around the table and so it's important that you and I understand two things from the text so far number one the Lord placed a real exclamation point by right at on, right here right here on at least two people worshiping together in agreement Amen. who agree as touching there's power and then this 20th verse it says so clearly two or three are gathered together in my name and then if you look with me, there's, there's a little outline here. The power of united prayer. Only two believers. That's all it takes for a forum. If you wonder how many do we have that, that we can really do business with God, one's enough, but two confirms it. That if we agree. Then notice, Christ said, anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them. And that's verse 19. What's the prerequisite? that we agree is touching now let's go a little bit deeper there am I in the midst of them note Christ did not say I will be there he is here I mean verse 20 it's I'll be there no no he's here that ought to make us I don't know what it would be like to express it in the Sometimes you just want to shout. Just shout at the glory of God. What he's done. And he put it right. He, he didn't put it on a shelf so tall that we can't reach it. He, he put it right in front of us. And think about what you and I have to walk around not to claim God's blessing. And the answer is pretty simple. Each other. Each other. Certainly there's friendship and fellowship. But I'll tell you what's more than friendship. Power. Power. There's power in agreement. And in our day, I'm afraid, if we get a pouty attitude, that we're walking away from his power. And we need to turn that around because I'm convinced the day's going to come. I'm hearing, I'm hearing health issues I've never heard. Uh, they, they, they got things going on around the world right now that I don't even think that, that our people would even. If they hid UFOs from us and that they had alien bodies from Area 51 and have had all these years, and there's millions of dollars in the federal budget studying this. And they've been in such denial to us and now admit that they were lying to us. What else are they hiding from us? And I say that, say this. I think there's a day coming that things are going to happen so big you can't cover it up. And we got to have the grace to face it. But you know what's shocking me? 
that those who really should be leading the pack in, in, in an army of the faithful are God's people. And sadly, if you peek and pull the covers back on the average church, church worship, those things that are in the unseen world, people in denial. Hey, there's a real devil. There's a real hell. There are real demons. It's real. It, it's, not, it's not some mythological thing. It's real. And Satan's been operating pretty much undercover because there's not many lights turned on, but thank the Lord he's raising up generations now, especially some of these younger people. They don't know any better. They don't worry about being PC. They just get up and tell it. And there's some, there's some good guys out there who are exposing some of this. But my point, my point is that if we're not in the habit of bringing everything to him, big or small. Whenever things do come, we're going to be overwhelmed. It's like I have people call me about some of the younger guys about teaching prophecy. And they tell me they didn't have it in Bible college, they didn't have it in seminary. They've heard a few guys preach on television. And that's all they know. They know more of the false propaganda than they do the Scripture. They know all these people who deny the rapture. They know all these people who deny so many other parts of it. And they ask me, where do you start? And I just have to say, and I can say because I'm older, I say, son, you just got to dive in the deep end of the pool and ask the Spirit of the Lord to help you. I got in on the shallow end and just gradually got in the deeper water. But there's, it, it's so deep now. You just got to dive in and let the Holy Spirit direct you. But having said that, I'm trying to drive a point home, and I don't want you to lose sight of that. I'm using these side issues as illustrations. But if we're not so locked in that we got two things going for us, Paul said, I know in whom I believe. Job said, though my Redeemer slay me, yet will I love him. And I'm paraphrasing. So we've got the testimonies in Scripture of, of Joshua and others who had this personal faith and walk. Well, we learn over in Ephesians 6 that, you know, we, we who are more mature are to look upon those who aren't and look down on them. We're to look down, we're, we're to look and, and just go down and pick them up. We're, we're to help shoulder them. We're to help direct them. We're to help, to help them by being a blessing to them. Not look with any kind of condemnation because they don't know as much as we do. We're supposed to help lift them up. Now, if we don't practice our faith, we're the loss. We're the loss. And so we can't just let days, weeks, months, years go by, and we don't roll our sleeves up and say, you know, today could be my last day. What do I want? How do I want to go out? Do I want to go out actively serving God and obeying his word? And taking his promises as a contract, as an agreement, as we've illustrated with the handshake. And then to line up like the geese or the ducks and fly in formation. Look, look with me. Just a few more couple of thoughts. Amos 3 and verse 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Is it possible that you can walk with somebody? without having some agreement between the two of you? Like, for example, how fast you going to walk? Which direction you going to walk in? And if you don't set some standard, you can't walk with someone 
And then if we're going to walk with the Lord, there's a high probability. Now, he won't leave us. He won't forsake us. But there's some things he's not going to condone. And he may not want to walk where we want to walk. So we got to be in agreement with him to walk where he wants us to walk because only there is his will. But Amos 3, 3 shows us that. And then if you look with me in John chapter 1, verse 7, notice this, fellowship with one another. Look, he says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from how many sins? All sin. So we, we got walking together and walking in the light. And again, as Amos said, two, two can't walk together unless we agree. We can't walk in fellowship with him without having our sins forgiven. And so once we fix just a few things, the power of God's there. It's not a hope so. It's not a maybe so. It's what he's promised. He, he's here tonight. And then if you'll go with me just a little bit and break down several things. One, and I, I, I didn't quote all the verses, but I want you to see them. And if you'd like a list, I'll give them to you. We're all born of the same father, John 1, 13. We're all bought with the same price, 1 Corinthians 6, 20. We all are members of the same body, uh, Colossians 1, 18. We're all taught by the same spirit, John 16, 13. We're all walking in the same path, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We're all serving the same master, Matthew 23, 8. We're all heirs of the same inheritance, Romans 8, 17. Just look at what we have in common. And then to have this age of so much dissension you gotta know the devil is a master of tricks and the master of deceit and disguise and what all that we have happening today in our modern church age is done in the name of the Lord with only one Holy Spirit there's no way he's doing all that because it contradicts his word. And so we got to watch. We got to watch. Look with me. Our power of agreement, one should be with friends. You agree on it? Say amen. amen. Family, would you agree? Say amen. amen. And then what? Faith. So if, 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 we, if we can just see that, Micah 6, 8 says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with whom? Thy God. So the handshake with God is the most important hand we'll yeah. ever take. Not just to receive him as our Savior. Don't miss that part. Not just to receive him as our Savior, but to lead us on our journey as we grow in his grace. Amen. Amen. Now, tonight, maybe because of the theme and what we've examined so far, maybe tonight, we can feel for those who are going through, through stuff. But life sure works better when we're one of the flock. And we're flying in formation. And just imagine for a moment, if the second duck's following the first duck and the third duck's following the second duck and then on down the line... And maybe the second duck decides he's going to go a different way, and he, he just peels off, and that means he's got two ducks following him. Do you think there's anybody watching us? See, the decisions we make are not just important for us, but there's some ducks behind us. They're watching. We must fly in formation. And if we get humbled by that, I believe that's what God intended. That's where he put it. He said if two will agree, it's touching. 
That doesn't sound complicated, does it? But it is. But it is. It's the heart of revival. When people, a group, large or small, come together with one heart, one mind, touching heaven, touching God, touching each other. It happens. It happens. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us tonight. Our needs, Father, are many and our burdens are heavy and on this journey, Lord, we're on. We, we just need you and family members and friends and folks here in the church that have various illnesses, some terminal, need you, need that touch that only you can give. Father, help us to be obedient. Help us to be submissive. Help us, Father, to be trusting of you and your promises to us. As we come to take communion tonight, we pray, Lord, you'd bless us. We pray that you'd bless us with the breaking of bread and the taking of the cup, that we tonight might grow in grace. Use us now for your glory. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. I think tonight, uh, I'm looking for Brother Dave. Brother Dave, if you'll come, please, sir. Paul, will you come help us on this side? And uh, Brother Jerry, would you come? And uh, trying to see who we're short on deacons tonight. Brother Kent, would you come? And if you would help Brother Jerry uh, remove the covers over on this. Or you can do this one. And, and Kent and Dave can, can take care of this one over here. And then we're going to have you come. And uh, just remove the covers. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll have you come and serve yourself. I think that'll make it a lot simpler. We'll take care of that. We'll get, we'll, ta we'll get that. Okay. What's communion about? The night of the Last Supper. Breaking of bread and taking the cup. We know it's Passover. So we have to examine the purpose of Passover. What was that about? Why? Well, the death angel passed over Egypt. In every home that the blood wasn't applied over the lentils of the door, there was a death to the eldest. And then we know the Lord, his death was on Passover. That's when he was crucified. That's when the, at the hour the lamb was to be offered. And uh, so as we take communion tonight, we know we are celebrating the death, the memorial is for the, the death of Christ, his burial, his resurrection. So I want to invite you to just come form two lines on each side. And uh, Dave, you can go ahead. We got one tray or two. One back there. Okay, well then, then uh, if you would, you can go take it. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, get folks served. Over. Jared, if you would serve the folks or have any, any assistance that is needed. Anyone needing assistance will take care of you in just a bit. Once you've returned to your seat, you can be seated.
Has everyone been served? We'll wait a second or so for Dave to get back. <clears throat> I suppose from the earliest age, going to church, and especially on communion Sundays, uh, as a child, I, I, I wondered about that. They didn't use matzo bread then. It was light bread that was cut in little squares. In fact, in my home community, I don't even know if they knew what matzo bread was. Yeah, you know, we just, just thought that was the thing to do. And a different family member would prepare. Uh, they had a roster of different services. And... Uh, there was that mystery to some degree in my mind as to what this, you know, what's this about. And if you stop and think for a moment of all the symbols that God could have used as an illustration of his body, which was his life, is bread. Whether it's matzah or loaf bread. It's matzah because on Passover there was no, no yeast. Yeast symbolizes sin. Doesn't take much. And before long it can really, really grow. Ellen baked some bread a little bit back and looked in the stove and that thing had exploded. It just, just kept growing. She'd put it out, you know, it, would, it, was, it rose, but when it got in the stove, it really rose. But it doesn't take much. And yet, he's a bread of life. And, and, and the word is life for us. Amen. It's the living word of God. I do believe that when we take the bread, we must remember how he gave his body to be abused. I mean, the, the, the treatment is beyond our imagination. There's no one ever, ever who suffered as he did for this one simple reason. If Satan had been able to kill him anywhere but on the cross, on the day he died, on Passover and before the lamb was sacrificed a few hundred yards away at the temple Satan would have won so you must we must understand that he came after the Lord with everything he had Isaiah says his visage his appearance was so mutilated that you would not have recognized him as a man Maybe, maybe just a mass of hamburger. He was so beaten. We know in Psalms that he said he could look. And his bones were staring at him. He could see his bowels. But he didn't die under the lash. He died on a cross to fulfill Scripture. We see that in Isaiah, not Isaiah, but 1 Corinthians Chapter 15. So we, you stop for a moment and think of that suffering that is symbolized in the bread. That in itself should humble us. I often, I often look at it and think, how could you love me? A sinner, unclean. How could you love me, period? But then love me that much that he paid my price and yours and the whole world. So imagine what he did. He broke bread that night. He blessed the bread. So let's pray as we ask a blessing on the bread. Heavenly Father, we take bread tonight in a memorial of your only begotten Son, realizing tonight that you loved us that much that you gave, you gave your only begotten son. We thank you for the love gift. And in return, Lord, we seek you with our whole heart. Bless us tonight to grow in your grace 
to be filled with your spirit and to walk with you. We thank you again. In Jesus' name, amen. Take and eat it. In like manner, he took the cup and he introduced that to them and I believe in a fashion they understood and it goes back to the Jewish wedding when the proposal was made by, by the groom to be, to the bride to be and basically already the parents, the fathers of both have negotiated a bride's price Interestingly, that was usually 30 pieces of silver. And that should ring a bell. Because that surprised Judas got to betray the Lord. But once that contract between the fathers were, were agreed upon, the groom-to-be would go to his future bride with the hope she would accept his proposal and the proposal was done with a cup anybody with Jewish friends you know that's practiced by many today and he would offer to her the cup saying something like this I love you I want you to be my wife I want you to take my life into yours and if she would she'd take the cup and drink the juice which was symbolic of receiving his life into hers. Isn't that what we did when we got saved? We asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into our heart, which is our life. And we asked to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, but that act is done whenever we receive him. The groom-to-be, then he, she would offer the cup back to him, and he would drink from the cup in reciprocating. I'm taking your life too into mine. And so with, we know that's what God did for us. We're in the family. Now whether it's the exact detail I share tonight, I don't know, but many believe on the third cup, there are four at Passover. The cup of redemption is the third. Jesus said to his disciples, I love you. I want to marry you. Will you take my life into yours? Maybe they sat stunned. I don't know. I don't know the reaction. I don't know the reaction that we have. But I challenge you tonight. When we, when we observe communion and this memorial, we're reminded. One of what he did for us, that's the broken bread. And then in turn, to receive him into our life. And we are reminded that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And so we have to know what the blood is symbolic of. And it's kind of got to be all under the blood for us. And if it is, we're one in family. We're one in agreement. And that's looking up to him. Lord Jesus, bless the cup tonight. We, we have this service tonight to honor you, your death, your burial, and your resurrection. Without any or either part of what you did for us, we wouldn't be saved. But because you did, we have salvation. So we invite you today, tonight, we give you our hearts and lives afresh. Renew that right spirit within us. And may we humbly walk with you as we leave the service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Take and drink it. And once they did, I believe there was some rejoicing. Amen. And... Uh, John 14 followed where he said let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me and my father's house so many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for whom you. for you the bride us and it's about finished I think he, he made the world in 
six days and rested, and he's been working on our home now for over 2,000 years. We will be satisfied. We will be satisfied. And for that, we thank him and say a hallelujah. Okay, well, fellas, if y'all can help us collect the cups, uh, then we will dismiss. You can just pass them to the end if you're near an end, and we can collect those. I trust that you'll have a good rest of the week. Anybody heard any more from the storm in the Atlantic? Is it going away, or is it still sitting out there? Still sitting? Is it, is it dissipating or just laying? They said it's going to get picked up and taken out to sea. No, didn't they? I hope. I need to move, and I don't need a storm to get in the way of moving. So pray for, pray for that particular need. I hate, hate to be selfish, but uh, after two and a half years, it will be two and a half years on the 30th of this month since we had the fire. Still got a hiccup or two to work out with insurance company. And uh, we just need God to bless it. That's all. And uh, it will be good to get home. Amen. And you know, sometimes it's either one. The one there or the one here. <laughs> but we trust the Lord to bless it. Well, God bless you for being here. Let's dismiss, and, and uh, we will have a little fellowship time, and, and we will talk to you all on Wednesday, the Lord willing. So God bless you.